Amen. If you have your Bibles, I ask you to open them up. Turn to Revelations chapter 3. Last week, one of the things I asked our church was uh, to get one of these purple sheets. We passed them out, and if you wasn't here last week, they're back there in the foyer. And on this purple sheet, it is a poem. But in this poem, I asked you to turn it into a prayer. And as the next couple of weeks we look at this in Revelations, it's talking about the churches. But you and I have to get out of the mindset when we hear the word churches, we got to get out of the mindset of four walls and bricks. We got to get into the mindset of when it's talking about churches, it's talking about us as people. We as the people, we are the church. This is just a building. This is just a sanctuary. We are the church. So if you didn't get one or if you got one and you forgot it or you lost it, we got plenty of copies back there. I ask you to grab it. And and in this poem, it's very challenging in some of the things it points out and, and can challenge us in our prayer life. So I just want to share that with you. But before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just ask you right now, Lord, to fill this place with your spirit and your power. Father, I pray no one would see or hear me, Father, but they'd see and hear you. Father, you you give us a a beautiful example in this whole chapter of different churches, a.k.a. us as people. And you show the different characteristics of us as people of how we reflect you in a good way, in a bad way, and in a way in which we neglect you, Father. Lord God, I pray that you would bring conviction upon all of our hearts in the areas where we fall short to bring you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. In Revelations chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 7 through 13. And last week, the church we looked at was a church in which had a reputation of doing good. You know, but it talked about how the Lord confronted them and said, you ain't done nothing. You've been standing on the sidelines and you've got work all around you that you haven't completed. You know, there's a lot of times we like to talk about our great successes in the past. We like to talk about how we used to be or how it once was instead of how it needs to be today and how it can advance forward in the future for God's glory and God's honor. You know, one of the things that God's been talking to me about my heart as I've been looking at this, just to think about something. If we were concerned about spiritual matters, as much as we're concerned about nonsense and gossip, imagine what kind of spiritual condition we would be in. Wow. Could you imagine what us as a church would look like if we were more concerned about people's spiritual conditions, people's lack of spiritual growth, Instead of as much as we worried about gossip and nonsense. Do you realize that there's more bickering and yapping about nonsense up in the church house than it is about God's spiritual growth? Let's just be real about it. And last week, the church in which we looked at, we talked about that church that that Jesus said, Hey, there's some areas that it's not too late. You can get up off the sideline, you can get up off your tail, and you can get to work, and you can finish some of these things that you haven't accomplished yet. And those things that are too late, it's too late. But you get up and you do something about it. Today, we're going to look at a church that was in step with God. We're going to look at people in whom had a focus and was concerned about spiritual well-being of today and not of that of the past. Check out what happens here in Revelations chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And the angel of the church of Philadelphia right? the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, 
Who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one opens. When we look at that verse, we're talking about that this church was a church in whom was instilled with God and no one can open that door. No one can shut it if God has opened it or God has shut it. No one can touch it other than God himself. Now check out what happens in verse 8. It says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. He's saying, look. I know your activities. I know your deeds. I know the things and what you're going on in your life. And he said this and what I've set before you. The door is open. And he's saying, look, no one can shut this door. Which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. He's saying, look. You as a church, you as people, I know your deeds, I know your work. And, I, I, and as long as you are in step with me and you continue to walk through that door of honor and glorifying me, no one can stop you. And then at the end of this verse, he says, you have very little power. He's saying, look, when we come to a point and realize it's not about us and it's not about our strength and our understanding and our ability, we kind of become humble. But when it's about our strength and about our knowledge and our ability, we're pretty daggum arrogant. And we're not very weak in our eyes. But when we realize that we are weak and God is strong and God is our strength, he's saying, look, these people will walk in humble. And he's saying, look, you don't have a lot of power. But he says, in your weakness... In your humbleness, you have died, denied my name. You realize that life happens. Circumstance happened to you. Circumstances happen to me. And there are times and during the day and during the week, we are face to face with choices and decisions of denying Christ or saying yes to the Lord. Amen. It don't matter if you're strong or weak. But he's saying, if you're humble and you're walking in me and you're allowing me to work through you and you don't den denounce my name and, and when those temptations of life are starting to overwhelm you, you stay true to God. He's saying, look, you're going to be blessed. Check out the next verse. Verse 9, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. You see, one of the examples in which he's given here, he's given the example. He said, look, those in whom are going to persecute you, it don't matter if it's in the church or outside. It don't matter what kind of conditions those people are in which they're going to persecute you. He said, look, those enemies, I'll eventually get a hold of them. And the Lord's saying, I'll get a hold of them in such a way they're going to come before you and bow down at your feet. Not for your pride or not for your arrogance, but that they may see how much you love God me and how much I love you many times we as humans we like to pay people back we like to say the last word we like to say I'm right and you wrong but right here in this verse he's saying look you stay true to me and you let me have the last word the Lord's saying and he says I'll bring those enemies down before you in some circumstances, he's going to humble them in such a way the love of God is going to shine through this situation. Here's the thing. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with staying true to God and not denouncing his name no matter how hard it is getting, how much temptations you're around? How are you doing with it? Many times we say, Oh, there ain't no way that I deny the Lord. 
Do you realize that through the New Testament there were people that said that? Many times we think it's the words that we speak. I never said I don't believe in God or that Jesus isn't the Son of God. Your actions is what speaks. When you're going to live in sin, you're going to wallow in sin in that pig pen, you're just denouncing God. It may not come, be coming through your vocal cords, but it's sure coming through your actions. God tells us not to live in the pig pen, to wallow in those sins of life. He says to walk above it, to not walk down that road. Because in our actions, when they are that of sin, you're denouncing Christ. And you're allowing those temptations to overwhelm you. Check out what happens in verse 10. It says, because you have kept my word about patience, endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. He's telling them right here, telling you and me as a church, if we'll be patient and we'll, we'll endure those trials that are going to happen to us and we'll show our faithfulness and, and our commitment to God, he's saying, look, there's going to be a time that I'm going to reach down and I'm going to say, here, my people, come on home because the rest I'm fixing out to judge. But you see the things in which he's looking for. He's looking for his people in whom are committed to him and whom are faithful to him in their heart and their deeds. Verse 11, it says, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. So he's saying, look, I'm coming. I'm coming. He's saying, make sure that you're in step with me. That no one can take the blessings away from you. Do you realize that when we look at this word crown, he's talking about that, that in which we are in heaven, those blessings in which are in those crowns. He talks about those jewels. And, and many times we start thinking about the visual thing. And I ain't been there. I, I don't know. But I can't tell you when he starts talking about these things of the crown and those jewels, he's really talking about the blessings. And when we get out of step with God, and when we start living like that of the world, really what we're causing, we're bringing shame to the name of Jesus. But we're robbing ourselves of some great blessings. I'm going to tell you, can you imagine if you stay true with God, even with those temptations of life, and you stayed step with and step with Him, and when you were there face to face with Him, he opened up those, that huge box that has your name on it and outpours the blessings out of that box upon you. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? I don't know about you, but I have a strong desire to store up a whole lot of blessings in that box. But the way to store those blessings up, it's not about you, it's about Him. And it's about living for Him through you. It's not about your strength and your ability. It's about being humble and committed to Him. Verse 12. It says, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He's saying, look, for those in whom are going to be obedient, those in whom will be conquerors for me, there's going to come a time that I'm going to display you in such a way that God's name's going to be written all over your obedience and you will be seen for your faithfulness to him. Can you imagine that moment that we can stand before him and he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant? We'll turn this around. If we settle just for that, that's incredible. But can you imagine if we hear that 
And he says, and on top of that, I'm, because of your faithfulness and your committed, commitment to me, you're going to be a pillar that will be so, shown from now on because of your faithfulness and your commitment to me. Why do we settle for less? Why do we just say, I'm just going to be good enough for God? Or I just want to get by for God? Why do we do that? Why do we not strive to be more every day of our lives? Why do we say yes to sin so much and say no to God so often? We allow our phones, our social media to have more attention than we do to God. We're more committed to what others think and others care about than what God cares about and what God is committed to. There was a story that I was reading as I was studying, and he talked about a bow and arrow and how God is the archer and how you and I are the bow and arrow. And if you were to take a bow and arrow and you were to pull it back, that bow would finally get to a point that says, if you pull me back any further, I'm going to snap. But the archer doesn't listen to the bow. He continues to pull it back that he may maximize the speed and the power of the era in which he is aiming his target at. Do you realize that God isn't concerned about your lack of faith and you want to whine and say, God, that's enough. But he is wanting to pull you and me back to a point that he is aiming his bow and arrow that we may hit the target in which he desires for you to hit and he desires for me to hit. But many times, as he pulls us back, we say, God, that's enough. God, no more. And we jump off the bow. One of the things that when I was learning, when I was uh, in junior high, was when I started bow hunting, is when I would pull my arrow back, it would jump off. The, the thing on the bow, and the arrow would fall over here. And I had to let the bow back, I had to reset my arrow, and I had to pull it back. And if I got to shaking too much, that arrow would pop off, and I'd have to set it back. There's too many Christians that when he starts to pull us back, we jump off. It's time that you and I lay still and lay flat upon the bow and allow him to pull you and me back that he may release us into the target in which he desires. But here's the thing. It's time that you and I become conquerors for God. Not for ourselves, not for our glory, not for our honor, but for him. It says in verse 13, just as it said last week, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. What do you hear God saying to you this morning? Are you hearing him say, look, there are some areas in your life you're not committed to me the way you need to. you got more things more important than me. Is your cell phone more important than your Bible? You know, many times I hear people, oh, I spent time with God. I, I read this cute little quote. Do you realize that a quote ain't a devotion? <laughs> and for the ones of you who think it, you need to think different. It's great to hear a quote, and sometimes some quotes can be challenges, but quotes aren't commitments in spending time with God. Amen. Opening up your Bible and reading your Bible and studying your Bible and spending time in prayer with God, that is devotion. Here's a challenge to you. What about take your Bible when you lay down at night and lay it on top of your cell phone? You say, well, my cell phone's my, my alarm clock. Great. Reach under your Bible and hit the little button and turn off the alarm when it goes off. But before you pick up your cell phone, you've got to pick up your Bible first. And you spend some time in it. Before you pick up your cell phone and find out what happened in everybody's life and just all their pretty vacation pictures. Here's the thing. We need to start picking up our Bible more than we are social media. We need to quit focusing on gossip and nonsense and start focusing more on our spiritual well-being. That verse 13, it told us 
Those who have an ear, let them hear. God is speaking to you. He is speaking to me. We need to be the church in whom He is well pleased with. We need to be a church that He wants to set us out and say, these people are committed to me. I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. But it is time that we quit settling for good enough or get by and we start committing to be conquerors for God. Let's pray. Father,